Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive. Uh, our guest tonight is going to be Giancarlo Brodo, who is the global education strategist from Smart Technologies. And based on his global research, we're going to discuss and explore how to apply tech-enabled practices that drive student learning and engagement. Uh, this solution was announced at FEC 2016 and includes Samsung Chromebook 3s along with the SmartAMP software platform and includes uh, the Smart Exchange. Uh, there may be a test afterwards, so you'll be expected to know that their bundle includes, that's, I was just talking about that, uh, but, but their bundle includes 10 Samsung, Samsung Chromebook 3s, uh, licenses for SmartAMP, professional development, and a 10 Google device management console license. And if you go to the Smart Samsung Chromebook Solution webpage, you'll be able to get more details, and we'll make this available to you also um, on our website. But first, uh, before we actually get started now, um, I'd like to explain a little bit about the Shindig platform. Uh, for those of you who haven't used it, you'll notice there's an there's a avatar of you in the lower right hand corner of your screen, and there's two buttons under that avatar. Uh, the raise hand button indicates that uh, that you'd like me to get in touch with you, uh, and um, if I'm not speaking up here, then then I will. Or uh, we may ask you to raise your hand at different times during the night, and then the ask button asks a question that only I can see. And so if you ask a question, I can see it. And then I can send it along to our, our guest, John Carlo, if it applies to him. If it's a technical question, I can either try to solve it myself or I can um, hand it over to the uh, Shindig folks. So uh, let's start with the with the raise hand button. I'm just curious, how many of you um, how many of you are educators? If you're an educator, what I'd like you to do is uh, click on the raise hand button. And let's see. So two, four, six. So there's about um, there's about 17 people here, and of the 17 people, eight of you are educators. Okay, so um, so about half of you are educators, um, and I know that there's a couple people who are on that are support for uh, for Shindig. So let me let me move on. Let me actually I'm gonna uh, you can now lower your hands or um, I can lower them as well. Uh, let, me, let me come back. And then uh, the next thing I want to describe about Shindig is if you move your cursor and highlight your avatar, you'll see that there's a three button menu over, um, you know, over your, your, your avatar. One of those buttons is called IM. Um, and if you click on the IM button, that's a way of having a back channel with other participants in your room. And we actually have two rooms tonight. Um, there's generally about 15 people in each room. So that's a good way to introduce yourself to other people who are here at the session. If you have comments or at different times, uh, Giancarlo may ask you a question and, um, and you, can, you can put your answers into the IM window. Um, right now, why don't you open up your IM window and why don't you type in where you're from to, as a way of introducing yourself to other people here. So I will say that when you type something into the IM window, everybody in your room can see it. Um, but as the administrator, I can't see it. So I have no idea where you are. If you want to get in touch with me, again, that raised hand button underneath your avatar, that's a way for you to type in something that, again, that, that only I can see. So those are some of the features of Shindig. And I think the biggest advantage of Shindig is that it allows us to do small group work. So you see that there's avatars for other people in the room right now. And what I'd like, what I'd like to do is, is to practice a small group work. I'd like you to click on the avatar of another person here. Um, it, that's if, if you have video and a microphone on, on your computer. And then I'd like you to get into a discussion with them and discuss you know, who you are and why you're here at this, at this webinar. And then also, what's the biggest tech challenge you face? and uh, share that with the other person. And it says here you have three minutes. Um, I think I'll give you, because we have a lot of information to cover tonight, I'll give you about two minutes 
um, to get into to conversations with other people. I'm going to pull myself down um, and I'll make the screen a little bit smaller so you can see the avatars of the other people. Um, and then uh, in about two minutes, I'll come back up and we'll introduce our guests. And now um, I just, you know, next week we have two sessions. Uh, some of you uh, have heard of John Hattie from uh, from Australia, who's kind of famous for visible learning. The other thing he's he's famous for is John Hattie did a an analysis um, of 150 different factors that can affect student learning, and then he's ranked them according to which ones are more effective. So I think he's going to be talking to that on Monday. And then on Tuesday, uh, we have another international speaker, uh, Zachary Walker, from, who's, uh, who's in Singapore. And he's doing a whole series on digital tools for enhanced learning. Uh, he's going to be covering how to use Twitter uh, with your students. Uh, you can sign up for either or both of those at www.edchatinteractive.org. And we'd love to see you at a future event. And we're happy to see you here also. Uh, tonight, our speaker is Giancarlo, Giancarlo Brotto. Uh, uh, Giancarlo uh, travels all over the world um, listening to and advising national education leaders. Uh, so that gives him the opportunity to see what's working, where the traps are, and what mechanisms edu educators use to, deter to overcome obstacles, especially involving technology. So uh, let, me, let me pull the slides down. And let me bring up Giancarlo. And there you are. How are you? Awesome. I'm good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro, Mitch. Okay. So, um, so I, I, one question. Uh, as I was doing a little bit of research about you, um, you said that technology is the Trojan horse that's going to allow us to bring about a revolution in education. So, uh, what does that mean? So, I mean, that concept's not new. It's, it's, it's not mine. It's probably back in the, I don't know, maybe 70s or 80s when televisions were in and they thought, oh, technology is going to change the world. And really, we went through so many iterations of it. But my, my mindset on it, and we're going to talk a bit about it today, is you need three key things to make a significant impact in education um, and to make any socially significant change. We're going to cover it today. And one of them, actually, we were not really good at. And so... Uh, we're left with not, uh, two of them. We're not so, we're, so we're left with one, and I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> we're left with one, and and that's and, and that has partially to do with uh, technology. Uh, and so my mindset is, you know, when we look at practice, and we know that practice kind of trumps all in education. Um, mm -hmm. Not everybody has the best practice, and the time it takes to get a, a mass group of people doing a certain practice is difficult and challenging. Um, and so what if technology became the Trojan horse? People love it. They bring it in their classrooms. And just by, sorry about that, just by bringing it in their classrooms, um, they start instigating new practices that they wouldn't have uh, had that technology not entered the classroom. So mm -hmm. that's my, my, uh, my kind of thought process about how technology could be a Trojan horse for education in that it can instigate practices that some people might never have uh, never have dreamed or, or been possible to to achieve. Okay, interesting. So, um, would you like me to bring up your slides? Are you going to use your slides on your screen behind you? What would you like yeah. to do? Yeah, if you want to share your screen, that'd be awesome. Uh, okay. For those of you that are watching, uh, I'm using uh, Smart Amp here, and, and Mitch is connected uh, virtually to the same workspace, and he's going to share you know, his screen so, so that you can so, actually see more something? detail. I um I messed up because I I actually in my mind I was thinking that you were gonna do use a screen in the background and so I have the wrong browser. Um, oh, that's so funny. So, so what I have to do, and this is gonna take um this is gonna take about two minutes. Um, is I have to sign off and then sign back on again um, with Firefox. Uh, so um, maybe you can give I guess. Some type of background, or um, sure, I'll do a sound desk. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. We'll, All right. We'll so just, you, okay. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. So I'll, I'll get started, anyways, while we wait for Mitch uh, and his slides. So um, I'll tell you a bit about my background. 
uh, I started, uh, as Mitch said, I, I taught, uh, it's actually been for about 18 years. So uh, the first uh, several years was actually at the University of Toronto, I taught statistics. Uh, and then shortly after that, it, uh, I spent six years in a high school class. Now, this is early in the 2000s, uh, and one-to-one -one wasn't that popular. In fact, it was the first, uh, I taught at the first school uh, in York Catholic, for those of you that are familiar with Ontario, York Catholic is a school board, the first school actually have a one-to-one -one program. So all kids walked in uh, with, uh, with laptops uh, in their hands. And I actually searched, you know, other schools to see what they were doing. And there was only a handful at that time to kind of learn and network with them to see, you know, strategies of what they were doing. And really what I discovered was everybody was kind of in this discovery mode. And we've come a long way since then. And there's, you know, tons of organizations, amazing organizations. I'll mention some uh, today that have, you know, studied and looked at, you know, what makes one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, effective and what are some things that we have to watch out for. Uh, so what I'm going to share with you today is kind of a high level, some concrete things that, you know, high level uh, strategies that you have to think of if you're, a, you know, a direct technology director, curriculum consultant, or, uh, you know, supporting in the support role with teachers. But at the same time, many of you are teachers, so I want to give you something concrete that you can do, that you can take away and think of and, and implement in your classrooms uh, when, you, when you start teaching even tomorrow. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you, and as Mitch gets the... Okay, yep, hey, I'm back. back <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. You can see my content, eh? On your screen, Mitch? Yes. Awesome. And... So, so Mitch is going to share a screen so you can see a little bit clearer. Here's a picture of what, you know, when I taught universities, this is the strategy that I, that I used. It was very, uh, very teacher-directed. And when I started teaching, when I transitioned to the high school, this is what my class looked like when I first started. I was still very much uh, in that mode. And in fact, what was different, though, is the kids had laptops. So about a month into school, I took this picture. Uh, and Mitch, we're not seeing your screen yet. Uh, oh, we're still I'm sorry. Uh, Let me see. Well, uh, frozen. It said, it said, frozen. Uh, <laughs> frozen you. Me, let me try this again. No worries. So as Mitch is, is getting the slides up. Um, so what you see here is a picture of my classroom. I took it in the first month because I thought, wow, these kids are like super engaged, right? They're using their you know technology. I could have went out and had coffee. And those of you that are in one-to-one -one environments know, and what I, it took me about you know, several years to discover, is that there's a spectrum to engagement. When not all engagement results in deep learning. And in fact, I took a picture of the last, my last month, six years later, and that's what it looked like. Right? This is a picture of what it looked like. And Mitch, we're still seeing uh, a frozen view. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, you know something? Because uh, I just noticed. I can keep going while you try to figure it out. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll be there in one minute, I think. No worries. Okay. So, uh, let me see. Is it? It's still not. Um, ah. Maybe. Oh, we're in business. We go. We're good. We're good. Okay. Awesome. You guys can see that better? It. A little bit more clarity? There we go. So, I mean, take a look. And, I mean, go ahead and send, you know, send it, put it in the ask a question box. Like, what are some things that jump out at you? What are some things that you visibly see are so fundamentally different from, from when I started uh, and this kind of this later depiction of, um, of, of my classrooms? Like, there's some really crucial things that stand out. And Mitch, if you can be the voice of people as they're sending in uh, their comments. Okay, so I can only see question, if people put them in as questions. If people put them into the IM window, Perfect. then you can see them in uh, in your room. Sorry. All right. So put them in as questions for for Mitch. Or put them in the uh, uh, IM. Anyways, put them somewhere and someone will read it. <laughs> there's some pretty key, you know, differences. I mean, there's a lot of activity, right? There's students physically moving. You know, some kids, you know, abandoned. Uh, abandoned the technology altogether, right? So you see here, you know, this student abandoned it. This student decided to work on their own. You see students working in pairs. You know, my favorite was Jimmy Chu, who'd be, you know, just walking around and making comments on people's work. And the biggest shift, though, and I don't know if you've noticed it, was the teacher, right? It's pretty obvious where the teacher is there. In this case, I was the one taking the picture. And in here, you see me kind of engrossed and immersed amidst the student kind of activating uh, activating learning and instigating learning um, within that group. And though, so we're going to talk a bit about practices that instigate and activate. Now, the end goal isn't for your classrooms to look like this. Your end goal would, you know, your vision or your picture of what it looks like is whatever you paint it. 
But I want to share with you, you know, why it's important that we talk about and we, we think about strategies to, to fundamentally shift how our classrooms work and, and how our kids learn uh, with the onset of technology. Now, when we look at research and the guys who shape policy, you know, at the OECD, uh, they just put on a paper that talks about, you know, computers, technology, and academic performance, right? I don't know, put your hand up if, if you heard about this report. And basically what it says is it hasn't worked, right? So they looked at, they compared the literacy and numeracy scores across all, you know, different countries across the globe. And then they compared, they, they looked at, uh, you know, the technology use and what they were using in their classrooms, mostly uh, to, uh, computers, laptops, uh, and tablets. And they noticed that sometimes there's a negative relationship. Those countries and schools who had more technology underperformed the countries who had less. And so I love what they said. It's, you know, we need a new approach to deliver on technology percentage in schools because we haven't seen it yet. And in fact, it's not new, right? Uh, you mentioned how he's going to be there on Monday. I mean, he does a synthesis of all the technology. And he looked at, you know, technology's impact over the last 50 years. And what has it been? Flatlined, right? And then he says, it's not that it can't work. It's just that it hasn't yet. Right, and so we need a new approach. So here's the new approach that, that uh, from the work that I've been doing the last um, several years, uh, that I'm going to suggest. And it, it's actually from this um, organization called the Global Implementation Initiative. So a couple of years I spent focusing on, you know, what does it take to implement technology effectively? And, and this is a group that actually looks at it at a, a global level. So these are what's called implementation scientists, um, and they actually study uh, implementation uh, and what it takes uh, to implement effectively. And there's three key things that you need to get any socially significant outcomes. And the first one actually has to do with the what you do, right? So you have to define what is the effective intervention. Right? So when you look at when you look at uh, uh, any implementation, it's asking the question: What is it that we're going to do that we know the research tells us? makes an impact, has an effect on teaching and learning. The second thing has to do with getting people to do it. So it's not enough to define, hey, this is what we're going to do. What you have to do is figure out the strategy, which will actually get people doing that new behavior, doing that new practice that you want. And then closely tied to that uh, are what's called supports. And those are the things, the finances, the people that need on board, all those other mechanisms that need to be put on place. But the two key things that you need are to define what you're going to do and make it clear and share it with others and make sure that evidence-based, in other words, this worked better than anything else that we could do, and we know it will work if we get people to do it. And the second thing is, how do we get people doing it, right? So how do we implement it? And that's usually PD and all those, all those different pieces. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk about our shindig webinar. We're going to focus our, our time on the practices, the best high-yield strategies in one-to-one, -one, and we're going to focus on uh, implementation, and we're going to have a discussion uh, about both of those. Sound pretty good? Let's let's get into it. And yes, there's a picture of John Hattie. It's so funny that he's presenting on Monday. I had no idea. Luke, I could say that I, I knew it, but I didn't. So, so let's go into different things that we can do. Well, if you spend some time looking at all the things you can do, there's a truckload of things that the research says, hey, this works, this helps kids, you know, achieve or, or to learn. You know, there's no shortage of things that we can do in education that's even been researched. And that's why, you know, someone like Hattie is needed, especially nowadays, because we have to synthesize and ask the question, okay, great, lots of things can work, but what works better than other things, right? And uh, you might talk a bit about it on Monday if you join the webinar. Basically, he, what he did is he compared, as Mitch said, one impact relative to the other, and what he found was that it was normally distributed. So when you lay out all the things that you can do to have a positive impact on student achievement, it's normally distributed. And the interesting thing is the average is about like 0.4. And about 80 to 90% of things that you can do actually will have an impact on student achievement, like reducing class size. That's like over here, 0.2. So what, what we want to do is we want to focus on these behaviors, right? And that's what I want to talk about and you guys have a discussion about today is what are the things on in that side, in that quadrant? Because if we get a mass group of people, if you as an educator start transitioning your practice towards those pedagogies and those teaching practices and get your students to do those behaviors, 
you will start seeing gains much faster than if you either continue doing the stuff that you're doing here, or if you, you know, start doing new things and those new things are somewhere down here. Hopefully that makes sense so far. Okay, so what are those things? Well, he synthesized it really simply by this statement here. And put your hand up if you've heard of this before, uh, if you're familiar with John Hattie's work. When you say put your hand up, you mean click on the hand and not physically <laughs> exactly. lift your hand up. Well, you could physically put your hands up too, because I could see some of you, but there's a happy I can't see. So raise your hand physically if you have your webcam on so I can see you. And those of you that I can't see, click on the raise hand button so Mitch can tell me who's raising their hand. So how many of you are familiar with, with this stuff? So, so far, only one, only one person. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So, so I'll dive a little bit into it because it's important you understand what these practices are. And I'm sorry, you, three people. Three people. Awesome. So, so visible learning, for those of you that don't know, is this concept that as a teacher, you want to create as many opportunities to expose the learning, to bring the learning or the process of the learning out to your eyes so that you can see how the student's progressing. Now, why is that important? Now, some people call that feedback. Now, it's not so much, you know, feedback so that you can give feedback to the students. What's more important about making learning visible to the teacher is that you can then become reflective in the moment. And you can then say, oh, wow, Johnny doesn't get it. Sarah doesn't get it. Timothy doesn't get it. Jonathan, Timothy, Sarah, John, and Mitch are thinking in the wrong way. I got to do something about it. And that's the key with making learning visible. When you expose learning, then once you see that, it forces you to become active or to activate or to do something about it. And so that's the idea, and that's the quote that he, he puts, which is, you know, you want to try to create opportunities where you can kind of be in the student's eyes. You can physically see what they're doing and how they're progressing so that you can get insight and you can change uh, your behaviors or your actions. Now, what's interesting is there's a researcher called Graham Nuthall, and he's a little bit of a nut. He put video cameras and microphones in thousands of students, and he had his researchers watch these videos. And what he was trying to do is actually get a sense of, like, make learning visible, but he was actually trying to see and hear what actually happens in the classroom. And he had some amazing, uh, interesting um, results, one of which was, I think, 70, I think it's 70 percent of what happens in a classroom a teacher has no clue about. I mean, that's a lot, right? So there's a lot of stuff happening in the background that the teacher's not aware of. So when you're designing or thinking about planning your, your learning, it's and especially with technology, right? Because we can document, we can capture. How am I using those devices? to expose the learning, to expose the process, to expose the thinking of those students so that it's visible to me so that I can do something about it. Now, what's, what's in also interesting about those things that Hattie talks about in the top right corner is it's also not about exposing the learning to the teacher. It's also about, you see in the bottom right-hand corner, you know, it's having students, when you, when you expose learning to even each, to, them, to students, to themselves and to other students, they, students can start seeing themselves as their own teachers. They can, they can start becoming more um, accountable for their own learning. So, so making learning visible, exposing the learning uh, is important for the teacher, but also for the student. Now, what's interesting about this is this isn't really new. If you think about, if you think about how students you know, learn outside the classroom, when they take a task and they're trying to set a goal, and the kinds of things that they do. And now some of you might be thinking, okay, Giancarlo, you're relying heavily on Hattie, like, is, you know, is that the be all and end all? Well, no, other researchers who, who study uh, what works in education, uh, and one of them is Robert Marzano, he does meta-analysis as well, he studies studies of studies. So someone did a, a, cool, uh, a, a, a cool study, I guess, comparing where Marzano and Hattie actually interconnect and I'll share it with you here. And what's interesting is, if you look at these practices and you compare it to the way kids learn outside the classroom, whether it's skateboarding, surfing, skipping rope, they have a lot of striking similarities. So for example, a clear focus, right? Setting success goals and success criteria. You know, I'm on the top of this half pipe. I want to be able to get up on the other side, come back down, do 180, and I want to not be able to not fall. Like I clearly know what I want to try to do, right? So kids define that. As a teacher, you need to be clear and define that when you start your learning. The other piece is getting active. So if that kid doesn't physically get on that skateboard and go down that half pipe, how is he ever going to learn? Same thing in the classroom. How do we get kids being physically active and involved in the process of learning, physically doing this stuff? And there's other pieces like, you know, it's not just about obtaining knowledge, it's applying knowledge. 
it's revisiting, right? Keep trying, going down the half pipe and coming back up. So it's revisiting content over and over, opportunities for feedback and collaboration, right? You look at kids, they always work socially together, right? They usually kind of when you see kids skateboarding uh, in downtown, you know, they're usually in groups, usually ever by themselves. So, so they, they intersect in a lot of these pieces with this concept of, of visible learning. So what I want to uh, uh, kind of instigate before we get into the discussion is, you know, okay, great. So this is the practices, but Giancarlo, early you said there was research that said technology is not really working. It doesn't really have an impact. And, and so we just recently uh, decided to look deeper into it. So in, in December, we, we launched a, a study. We got uh, three consulting to, to do a lot of the analysis and the design stuff and all the back end research and do the final analysis for us. And what we were looking for is these specific practices in classrooms. We were looking for these high yield strategies, high yield practices. And also a wider variety of technologies, whether different types of front of room, you know, projectors or interactive projectors or flat panels or, you know, interactive whiteboards, as well as different types of student devices, right? Because the, the previous research didn't look at, you know, students with cell phones. And so we looked at all these different devices, all these different hardwares and a bunch of different software, which also the study didn't cover, that would instigate or promote these types of practices. And we want to see what, what would result. Now, a lot of interesting things came out of it. One of the clear things was that still pedagogy is such a critical piece. In other words, the practice you use with the technology, and we all know this, uh, is so important. But it also shed light that the presence of technology and this concept that I mentioned of Trojan horse is starting to come up here. Just the presence of technology could, could, uh, could provide some hope for us. Now, what you see here on this axis is, uh, and I'll just bring it up a bit so you can see a bit better. At the bottom axis here is it goes up by uh, a frequency of use of technology. So these categories here are people, sorry, this category here are people that, that use technology very, very frequently or a, a lot. And then this category here would be people that don't use technology that frequently. Now, at the top here on this axis, what we did is looked at practices. So these are the people at the top level here who engaged in high-end practices, high-yield strategies, well, like every day or in most lessons. And what you notice here, and at, at the bottom, we looked at how successful they were on a variety of different criteria, not just standardized tests, but other, other criteria. And what you notice here is the worst performing group were the ones that had no to little technology and no to little uh, evidence of those high-yield strategies. The ones who outperformed were the ones who had access to technology, as well as using that technology for those practices. Now, second to that was the having access, not no access to technology or using technology not as frequently, but using those high yield strategies very frequently. And then third was actually people who had a high uh, use of technology daily or frequently, uh, but their practices weren't as frequently. And what was interesting is they, the greatest bar on here was those that had mixed success it's kind of like a gamble, right? When you give someone technology, it may or may not work. But it's actually better than those who don't use technology. So there's hope. Um, now, the, and just so that you know, we're, I'm giving you a copy of, you can download a copy of all of these slides. I prepared kind of a, a summary for you. And this one in particular, there's a link where you can actually download our, our report. And then the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to put out a, a, a more extensive report so you can get more info on it. Now, I want to bring up one last point before we start talking, and that's when we look at how uh, teachers are uh, instigating students in terms of what they're doing with the devices, right? If you think back to this, how kids naturally learn inside the classroom and how these visible learning, how do you think <laughs> students use devices? Do you think they use them more to consume or create? If you think it's consume, put your hand up high. If you think it's create, put your hand down low. For those of you that have a webcam so I can see it. What do you think? I see some love. So, I, so I, I would just like to say that if you think people use devices to consume, you can click on the the hand button. And Perfect. I'll, so so far, only one person thinks that uh, students use devices primarily to consume. Ah, never mind. Um, I'd say about just under just under half 
believe that students that teach that students use devices primarily to consume. Huh. Okay, so check this out. When we, we looked at the how students use tablets, laptops, devices for learning in school, majority of the time it was used for consumption. Right, so it's watching videos. So basic, you know, on, on the higher thinking skills, it's kind of like on the bottom, just watching uh, and learning vers uh, versus being more actively encouraged on the top, on the higher end. Now, uh, Common Sense Media did a study earlier that looked at use of student devices outside of the classroom, not for school. They found the exact same thing. In fact, their percentage was even lower. Three percent of students actually use devices to create. Right, and that's concerning. Right, so it's 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 telling us that we need to do. Uh, we need to think critically about what we're getting our students uh, to use these devices for. All right, so let me synthesize so that we can get into a discussion about all the stuff that I just shared. Basically, if I summarize what, what I just talked about, there's two kind of main ideas that kind of jump out. And that's when you're designing your learning environment, when you're planning your learning environment, your one-to-one -one learning environment, you want to create opportunities where you expose the learning. You make it so that you, the learning is visible to you, and then you make the students uh, their, their own learners. At the same time, you want to think about, you know, tap into the way, use the analogy of how kids naturally learn outside the classroom, right? They're creating, they're working socially, you know, they're actively involved and engaged. They try things over and over. They don't just do it once, try it one day, and then they're done. Okay, we learned exponents today, exponents is done. No, they come back to it two weeks, three weeks, a month later. So they revisit things often as well. So thinking about those concepts then. So, what so I want, can I to make learning visible? Can I just right. give kids more worksheets? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that one. <laughs> right. And so it's not about, and, and earlier I mentioned engagement is, you know, on a spectrum. It's not about getting kids busily doing stuff. Like when my students are along the hallway, you know, along the, the walls and they look like they're all engaged. It doesn't necessarily mean they're active, <laughs> right? And so what you want to do is create opportunities where uh, it almost forces them. And, and the best way to do is, 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 you, is the type of task you design. Um, and you, if, you, if you design it with this collaborative focus, where they have to work collaboratively, usually those tasks where it's just answer questions number one, two, and three, don't only really work out because you know what's going to happen. Kids will work themselves. So if you think, how do I design a task where kids have to talk to each other? That changes the types of questions you ask and the types of things that you instigate your students to do. So what I want you to do, in fact, is have that exact discussion. <laughs> but Mitch, Mitch just asked me. What I want you, you guys to talk about is share examples with each other about you know, times or opportunities where you, know, you, guys, you, you yourself have you know, made learning visible or ideas that have come to your mind about you know, concretely you know, in your class, in your lesson, for your subject that you teach what you can do, how you can modify something, or something you've already done to make learning visible. And the other thing I want you to talk about is the other way. You know, how do we tap into this concept of, of, of tapping to make kids naturally outside the classroom? So share with each other, you know, how frequently you engage students in, you know, collaborative tasks, right? Or how frequently you get students right, to do tasks that, that require, you know, descriptive feedback to, the, to each other or to their peers. So what I'm going to do is I'll leave you with that screen. Sorry. I'll leave you with that screen up that Mitch has. And what I want you to do is, is pair up. And there's some of, um, some of you in the audience that actually I gave um, an AMP workspace to. So those of you that, that have the AMP workspace, uh, I'm going to get you to make sure you join a group that doesn't have one of you with the AMP workspace. Um, and they're going to document, so someone from your group will actually document the doc conversation that's going on. Uh, and then Gabe, who's, uh, who's on the line as well, is going to share kind of a general observations, what he noticed about what everybody was talking about. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do for those of you that uh, have the AMP workspace, uh, for those of you that don't, don't worry about it. I, I emailed the little select group of people. Uh, take a, uh, once you're in AMP, I'm going to share this file with you. Uh, and the rest of you, if you want to start getting into groups uh, and start answering the question amongst uh, each other, that would be awesome. Uh, and those of you that have access to AMP, I'm going to pull you into this workspace. And you can get documenting. So this is the time, I see a few of you have already done this, is to find the avatar 
of oh can i do you want actually so do you want me to open it says open uh, do you want me to open it the uh, uh not you mitch you okay you don't open so it. You uh, the up there. so if i it's it says open now is there i don't see a no i'll just click off the page i did oh <laughs> so sorry <laughs> <laughs> you can you can uh you can uh you can just hit uh refresh refresh okay and then you should be able to go back into it so yeah so anyhow so this this is this is the time to click on the avatar of another person who has video and uh discuss these two questions although um, I don't really have the questions on my screen, but basically, it's we're we're going to be talking about you're going to be talking about what um, what are the opportunities for visible learning, correct? You got it. Yeah. How do you do it in your classroom? And I'll pull the questions up for you guys. Okay. So what are the the things that you do that you you know opportunities where you've created opportunities for visible learning, and also uh, when you're designing tasks, how frequently do you design it where students are working collaboratively and giving each other concrete uh, feedback. Okay, and if you don't have video and you're not paired up with somebody, um, it would be great if you could uh, type in examples into the IM window. So pull up that IM window again, and what I'll what I'm going to do, I'm going to shrink the other window to give you to give you more room on your screen, so you can see each other better. Um, but uh, in, in the IM window, go ahead and type in examples, and then I'm going to rely on Gabe and Amanda to, uh, to, to get those to me so that, I can, so that I can share them with Giancarlo. Okay. Giancarlo, do you want me to uh, bring you down so that you can kind of uh, from group to group? Yeah, totally. That'd be awesome. Okay. Okay, so Giancarlo, just a, a couple things. Uh, were you able to talk to anybody else? Else? Uh, I was, yeah, on the side here, and and actually, what I'd like to do is, um, Gabe. Gabe has been kind of scanning uh, what people were capturing based on the conversations they were having. Um, so, can we actually pull Gabe up to talk right. a bit about kind of what he heard overall about the conversations? Uh, so, basically, while we're waiting for Gabe to jump on. Um, we had uh, some people actually capture some of the conversation for us. So Gabe, you were watching the Amperwood space uh, for what people were writing down. Can you give us a quick synthesis of what are some of the things that you heard, uh, highlight some of the, the pieces? Definitely. Um, can you uh, pass control to me so I can share sure. it on the screen so they can see? All right, so you're driving. Thank you very much. So one uh, kind of group that I was watching while they were doing is uh, group Christian. Um, one thing that I, I did notice that was really cool is that I would actually like for them to elaborate a little bit on was my students created workspace with other students and that way they had to show what they knew and explain their own learning. So um, that's kind of the feedback kind of in general that I saw. I also saw Rebecca put in something very similar about collaboration in her class and uh, there were some really good things also in um, a couple of other groups, but is there a way we can bring up maybe someone from group Gretchen to explain a little bit? I'm not sure if we can. Hey there, can you? Hiya! Yeah, I can! Hiya! I saw what you were putting in your workspace and I thought maybe you can explain to the group and elaborate a little bit about how the students actually um, explain their own learning. Okay, sure. Um, I had um, our students created workspaces. Uh, we had the Pittsburgh Penguins come to our school uh, last week. So we had our sixth graders created actually workspaces using information about the Pittsburgh Penguins and they made collaborative workspaces, we had them in pairs, and they actually made the spaces using nouns and verbs and multiplication and division questions for a younger group. We had the sixth graders create them for third and fourth graders, which helped the sixth graders have to actually use skills and explain what a noun is and a verb 
and multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. So the sixth graders had to prove that they knew what those things were in order to create the space. So they, are, they had to know and be able to explain it to the younger students. So they had to show that they were able to make those workspaces and create them. And they were fabulous. We had nine groups because I have 17 students. And um, what they were able to develop was way beyond anything that we could have ever designed ourselves. So, so the kids took ownership of their own learning at that point and were able completely. to completely. You you were, became more of a facilitator, a coach instead of mm -hmm. the person that mm -hmm. was learning. The kids are actually able to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guided them and said, you know, with the spelling and and all of that to make sure that everything was spelled right and and phrased right to make it so that they knew what to do, but in the space, but they, you know, they had a rubric and a guideline, but, but they created the entire thing. It, they were phenomenal. So. Okay. Would you like me to uh, bring up another person? What, what would you like me to do? Just, just for the sake of time, I would like to bring up Giancarlo. I see him waving his hand. So. Okay. Uh, all right. Like so, yeah. Okay. So Giancarlo, uh, click the raise hand button and I'll bring you right back up. There you are. Cool. Awesome. So thanks. Thanks so much. And I mean, that's a great, uh, I wish we had more time because I, I was scanning as well what people are writing and that's basically the essence of it, right, is, is you pass over the creation um, and that's a great strategy. So kids have to create something, they have to physically create a tangible object. And in that, you know, they have questions, they have discussions and that, um, and then you really kind of frees you up to kind of go around and kind of moderate and take a look at what's happening and activate the, the questioning. So awesome for you to pick that out. And thanks so much, Gretchen, for, uh, for sharing it. Mitch, if we can get you back on, I want to just quickly tease people with the last thing, because I promise you I'm going to share two insights about um, creating transformations in one-to-one -one spaces. We talked yes. about what types of practices, but this one, I cannot let people go without sharing it. Uh, and I, I might steal Hattie's thunder on Monday, <laughs> but uh, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but really, really important. Second thing they have to be cognizant of if you want to make uh, transformational change in, uh, in ed. So let's throw your screen back up. Uh, All so right, this might take a minute see the slides a little bit better um, and basically in the beginning I talked about three things right what you do so it's that high yield evidence-based practice then how you get a mass group of people doing it so how do you even yourself okay great I'm learning learning <laughs> but how do I get myself to do that on a more regular frequent basis well the, the key for that and let me put you in following mode so now you can see where I am bang there you are so the key for that is you know people think PD, professional development. Well, just slapping the stick of professional development doesn't necessarily uh, get you those outcomes. Let me uh, let me share with you an example. Project Red, um, I put the link in the file that you're going to get. It's an organization focused, it's a spinoff uh, as well, one-to-one -one institute now is part of that or kind of manages that. They did this really cool study a couple, several years ago, three, four years ago. They looked at one-to-one -one environments, but they also measured how they implemented and gave them a rating of how they implemented. And we can see from this graph is that, yeah, there were successes in that one-to-one -one environment, but the red is the successes of the groups of the schools of a thousand of them that actually implemented effectively, right? So you can see much bigger gains when you implement effectively. But what I want you to take note of is how many of those a thousand schools actually implemented effectively? 13. <laughs> and what that example, it is one of, millions of examples around the world is that we are not good at implementing globally. In fact, this Ruth Global Implementation Initiative, in their keynote, the director got up. The first thing she said was, the reason why we're here is because we haven't figured out how to implement effectively across the globe. And that's why we're here as researchers, implementation scientists, to try to crack it and, uh, and, and get at it. Okay, but there's hope because there are some things that we've learned to help with implementation. I'm going to share with them with you right now, there's two things. The first one has to do with making, picking a team. In fact, there's research that showed just by assigning a team of people that says, hey, your job is to get this group of people, 80% of our teachers, to do these practices in the next three years. Just doing that, defining people to, to a specific task of ensuring implementation, your chances of success 
skyrocket, right? So that's the first piece of advice. Pick a team whose job it is to implement. If you're at a system level. And, and what does 17 years versus three years mean? Oh, the time it would take. <laughs> so when they try to implement something new without a team, it took 17 years to get only 14% success on average. And this is data from the US Department of Education from 2000, 2001, 2007, 2011 on education and in healthcare. Whereas when you had an implementation team, it took three years and they had 80% success rate. So just having an implementation team matters. Now, the second piece uh, that, that's so critical, uh, and I'll share a story with you. Last year, I was at this uh, summit for the teaching profession, a bunch of ministers, 17 different countries, the minister, deputy minister, staff, teachers, administrators, even students, all got together. We sat in tables, assigned seating. Nobody from the same country could sit together. We had thought leaders. You'll recognize some you know, researchers up there. There's Fulton up there. A lot of key thought leaders and influences in education. They talk to us a bit, and then we go and we discuss in our groups. The last day, on the last day, they, they gave two hours for every country, two to three hours, to sit together and synthesize what they learned and what they uncovered. And in this round table, country by country, with the camera on them, they had the ministers get up and share what they noticed was this key thing that kept emerging and what they needed to do. And they had to decide on what they would do as a country uh, at the end of it. Now, there's a video. We don't have time to show the video, but in the file, you can uh, you can click on the link and post it on YouTube. You can watch what they said. Almost every single minister, except for two countries, <laughs> and every single minister mentioned the importance of teachers collaborating together. And in fact, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, he had his global conference, and he's still doing synthesis and meta-analysis to see you know what's at the top of his you know normal normally distributed curve. Guess what's emerging on the top now? <laughs> I'm totally spoiling his son thunder on Monday. And, but, but join him because I'm sure he's going to elaborate a lot more than I am. What's emerging at the top is creating more opportunities for teachers to work collaboratively together. So when, teachers, when you work with other teachers collaboratively to talk about your impact on students, that's where we see tremendous gains. And so the end message here that, that I leave with you is if you want to increase their chance of success, right? We already know the kinds of behaviors that we want to activate in our classrooms. But if you want to increase their chance of success, make sure there's a dedicated team that's in charge of getting people to do practices. But if you're just a teacher, something you can do is start creating more opportunities for yourself to work with other teachers about the kinds of things that you're doing in your classroom. And what better way than with technology that captures student thought and insight, and then you can bring that to your teachers, right? Bring that with your fellow colleague teacher. Look to see what kids are doing. Have discussions about did this get it, did they not get it? What do I need to do, right? When you teach, you document everything you're doing. So you know, I did this and this was the result. Have that rich discussion with your teachers. And if you do those two things, um, there's no doubt in my mind, um, you, you can make significant changes and, and impact in one-to-one in -one environments. So Mitch, I'm noticing we're at the top of the hour here. I did have some other discussion questions. Uh, these questions are in the file. Totally use the deck in your own school. You might, you might just use this deck to instigate that conversation about what are we going to do to have more teachers collaborating together within our schools. Um, thanks so much for, for, for letting me have you here today, Mitch. I'm going to throw it back to you uh, so that you can do some closing uh, commentary and wrap up. Um, but it was, it was awesome uh, being able to connect with everybody today. So uh, yeah, well, John Carlo, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe we'll come back for a second half some, sometime also. I would be happy to come back, because uh, so, that would be interesting. You know, just you know, we we talked about one instance of uh, visible learning, the, the the great example from the uh, teacher in Pittsburgh. Um, just, you know, I think it might be helpful. Can you just share like like three or four other examples of uh, of activities that teachers do that make learning visible? Yeah. So things that I I read that I saw. Uh, was having students uh, take the ownership for the actual creation of the task like that. And I think Gabe had noticed that and brought that up, where it's, you know, oftentimes we think we have to script everything and plan everything, the questions, and first the kid's going to do this, and then the kid's going to do that. But sometimes what you need to do is define the question or the problem, and then let the students be the ones who actually construct the construct as to how and what they're going to do to solve it, and also 
um, what the final product could look like. Because oftentimes we say, everybody needs to create a picture at the end. But when you start with more of a problem, and I heard some of these uh, examples, where the student actually decides what that end final product is, then what that does is inscate students in the types of discussions and learning that's a lot more aligned to the way that they learn outside, which is a lot random and, uh, and, and richer. And, and what you do then, and you use your devices and you use the software, things like AMP or whatever software you have that's collaborative or that documents it, have them document that process. Have them, you know, put down, first we tried this, here was our brainstorm. Then, you know, uh, this is the next thing that we came up. And then what you do is you, you go in and you, you take a look, you instigate and then you, um, you, uh, uh, you know, you kind of see what, what, ha what you have to do next based on what's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the styles of things that I, that, I, uh, that I also noticed as well when I was looking uh, through what some of the people were, were commenting on. Okay. And then uh, just people should know we're going to put these slides up. And I think that, uh, that Samsung, Samsung and Smart, uh, between the two of you, uh, you'll probably uh, be sending them the, the slides as well or at least putting them up on a website so that, so that people can download them and, and look at them. And um, I guess we're, we're, we're past the hour. Uh, you kind of gave a, an interesting introduction to John Hattie, um, but, which, uh, you know, so that's Monday. If, if, if people are interested, that's going to be at, at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then, um, you know, we we'll hope to see back was, I, I think it was, it was great. I, re, I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of people got a lot out of it and, um, and, and people will get even more out of it when they, when they see the second time, once it's posted on the, on the archives. So, uh, thank you very much and, um, you know, hope to see you again. Awesome. Okay. My bye. pleasure. It was awesome. And I'll probably tonight, I'll uh, tweet out uh, a link to the presentation and my Twitter's on here. Um, in case you want the presentation quicker. <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, don't forget to, to take a look at, at Smart Technology and at Samsung, our sponsors for tonight. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Jean Carlo, I'll, I'll, I'll pull you down. Uh, thanks again. And this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm going to sign off also for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you at a future event and hope you learned a lot and really enjoyed tonight's event. Uh, good evening and uh, see you soon.